Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bonavera Institute. For those of you who haven't met, I'm Kate O'Regan, the director of the Institute. And we're delighted this evening to be talking about one of the programs of the Bonavera Institute, um, the Bonavera Summer Fellowships in Human Rights, the Rule of Law, and International Law. For those of you who don't know, the Bonavera Institute is a relatively new institute in the Faculty of Law in the University of Oxford. It's now mm -hmm. only two years old. But actually, this will be our fourth year in which we've presented a fellowship program. And in front of you, you see a whole array of people who are going to talk to you in a minute. They're former summer fellows on the Bonavera pr program, and they're going to tell you about their different experiences. We also have with us here Gayatri from um, um, Oxford Pro Bono Publico, who run their own internship program, but which the Bonavera Institute administers for them. And she'll describe to you their program in a minute. Um, I just sort of wanted to start firstly by saying why we really believe in this program, and that is that one of the things that the Bonavera Institute believes in is that the intersection between scholarship and practice is a way of enriching both, so that if as scholars one works with practitioners, one sees different ways of thinking about the law, and one gets insights into the law that you don't get if you're just a scholar, and similarly, if you're a practitioner, you gain insights into the law from scholars that are often enormously valuable. And this program is really an opportunity to give um, Oxford students an opportunity to experience that firsthand. The program has been built with the very generous support of a range of donors, <coughs> um, in particular Eric Lewis, who's a member of the Advisory Council of the Bonavera Institute, and he's an attorney who has managed the difficult balance of being both a commercial lawyer but also a human rights lawyer in a practice in Washington, D.C. Um, our, founding, um, our founding donors, Eve and Anne Bonavera, have supported this. Um, and we have a range of other people who've supported it. So I just want to express our gratitude to them. Without them, this is a relatively expensive program to operate. Uh, we would not be able to, to offer it. But I also want to thank our partners because, by and large, the way this program works is the Bonavera Institute builds partnerships with a range of organizations around the world because we find that that best guarantees that the relationship of an of a internship here can be a win-win situation. We make sure that we have clarity from our partners as to what they're expecting from our fellows, and we make sure that um, our fellows know what our partners are expecting as well. And we actually enter into um, understandings with each of our partners about what we, how we expect them to work with our fellows. And we also will do the same with the successful fellows, sort of stipulating what it is that you're, um, you are undertaking to do when you accept this. Uh, we also offer and committed to the project of a living wage. So we make sure that everybody who goes to an um, internship gets a living wage. Many of you will know that many of the um, fellowships and internships in this area of law are often unpaid, and that, of course, excludes a whole range of people who aren't from families who are independently wealthy from doing it. And we have been committed right from the start of making sure that people who participate in these fellowships can do so regardless of their own personal circumstances. And that's one of the reasons why we've had to rely so heavily on donors to make it possible. So I'm not going to say very much more other than that we do have this very interesting array of partners. We have a very interesting array of former fellows here who will give you more detail. But the real opportunity or purpose of this evening is to give you an opportunity to hear about the program, but also to ask all the questions that you want to ask. So I'm going to hand over now to our team who are going to present it. Firstly, Sanya Santani, who's an RA at the Bonavera Institute and a former summer fellow herself. Um, and then to our new... Um, uh, programs manager, Christo Christos Kiprias, um, who will introduce the um, former fellows and uh, the discussion. And Christos will be very responsible for managing um, this program um, in the weeks ahead. So he's your, good, your contact point if you have any questions or queries about it. And then obviously I've mentioned Gayatri, who's going to speak in a moment as well about the Oxford Pro Bono Publico program of internships. I hope you enjoy the evening. I look forward to getting a chance to chat to you all afterwards. Over to you, Sanya. Thanks, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, you may have received emails from me before, maybe not. 
I used to be the mooting coordinator, Francesca, you know that. But I'm now currently the um, research assistant slash events assistant at the Bonavero. And I also had um, the opportunity to be one of the fellows. So you'll hear more about that later. I'll tell you more about that later. But first, um, I thought I'd quickly run through the various options on offer and the eligibility criteria. All of this information is available on the website. So don't panic. There are lots of options. It's great. Um, yeah, uh, maybe we'll go through the website after this as well so that you can see. Okay, so as Kate said that the aim of this sort of program is to ensure that we build a community of human rights activists, um, people who care deeply about the practice and scholarship of human rights. Uh, we see commercial law uh, barristers and chambers having a lot, putting a lot of money into outreach work and uh, we don't see that kind of um, support for human rights work simply because there is no money put into human rights work. But what the Bonavero Institute seeks to do is offer a platform for such work um, to be um, uh, provided as an opportunity for people who are interested and also to cultivate more and more interest in human rights activism and um, legal practice. So um, we also aim to create a community of the former fellows as well, uh, people who can contact each other later on in life. Um, you'll hear again more from the former fellows and their various experiences across the board. So what does this particular fellowship program offer you that independently applying for an internship doesn't offer you? And the most important thing, for me at least, was the bursary. Um, because, like Kate mentioned, at the Institute, there's a focus on providing fair remuneration and the living wage uh, for people who want to undertake these internships but may not have the means to do so otherwise. Um, so it's really very helpful to apply for these, uh, to apply to these organizations through the Bonavero Fellowship Program. Additionally, there's also um, impactful work that you can do in the social justice sector um, that uses law as a tool for social change in various ways. Um, when we go through each of the programs, you'll see how um, you'll see which one is a good fit for you, and we can talk further if you have any questions. Okay, so the first one that we've got is uh, the Air Center, and um, there's a lot of information on the slide, but very briefly, the Air Center is one of the biggest litigators in the European Court of Human Rights. So, if you're interested in human rights law and how um, well I suppose the relationship between the UK and Europe is going to be moving forward. Um, this is a good organization for you to apply to. Um, they do a lot of refugees and asylum work, a lot of work on deportations and forced removals, as well as children in migration. Um, so cutting edge issues in relation to this. Um, most recently, um, they appeared in the ECHR in MSS versus Belgium and Greece, for example. So you can look, look them up and see if they're an organization that you'd be interested in. Uh, you'd have the opportunity to gain hands-on experience of standard setting in both the CJEU and the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Euro European Court of Human Rights. You'd also provide direct advice to individuals, make a contribution to ensuring that EU law works really well for the benefit of everyone. Um, and of course, there's a funding amount of £3,400 uh, at the maximum. So those of you who are worried about visas, etc., um, this will be covered by that. Uh, the duration of the internship is about eight weeks. It's, all of this is negotiable, but this is just generally what we offer. Um, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law is the second one, uh, and that's at Bickel, the British Institute for International and Comparative Law, also based in London. Um, now, with Brexit happening, there's going to be a lot of research devoted to what the withdrawal agreement means. Um, for example, what trade's going to look like between the UK and EU, um, and so, as more and more details of Brexit need to be hashed out, research organizations like Pickle uh, would be a good place uh, for research assistance on these issues. So, if you are interested in applying your mind to one of the UK's biggest issues of this decade, this is a good place for you. Um, it's a research organization primarily, so there's a, there are comments on legislations, on international agreements, etc. What you will do is assist with the current research, and you also have some capacity to suggest new projects and events uh, as things unfold. Uh, the duration of this internship is also eight weeks, and it's the same amount of funding as the previous internship, which is £3,400. Um, next one is the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, uh, also based in London. Um, with the recent push towards investigating what can be done about modern slavery, 
Um, and of course, the Bonavera Institute's establishment of a new evidence center in modern slavery. Um, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center also does similar such work. Uh, there is an, if you're interested in the liability of corporate entities um, in human rights claims, and this is the sort of internship that you'd look at, there are various human rights issues as well as environment law issues, trade law issues uh, that all uh, arise in the corporate space, and uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center seeks to tackle those things. Um, the slide talks specifically about building corporate transparency and accountability, but you do this through law um, rather than through policy. Um, you will be uh, working on research, communications, and advocacy at this in this particular program. This also is for a duration of eight weeks, uh, and the funding is about the same, £3,400 at the maximum. You can also speak to uh, one of the postdocs at the Bonavero Institute, Katya, or Ekaterina, uh, because she works specifically also on issues of modern slavery and will be able to guide you if you have any questions. Um, the Center for Law, Justice, and Society, De Justicia, in uh, Bogota, Colombia, is another internship that we offer, uh, another one of our partners. Um, so they're quite interesting because not only do they do uh, litigation-related work, but they also have uh, Global North and Global South partnerships. Um, and recently there's been a big focus on environmental, uh, environmental law and issues of social justice related to climate change and the climate crisis. Um, they call themselves a think or a do tank, think and do tank, uh, which combines both research and activism. So uh, if that's the sort of space you're looking at where people walk the walk as well as talk the talk, then you should probably think about applying there. Um, the funding is £4,000, and that should take care of um, the various requirements that you would need to go to Colombia to undertake this internship. And um, it's for about 10 weeks um, that you could undertake this internship. Um, you could speak to Gayatri for a bit more information because um, her moot partner, Ayushi, had undertaken this internship. So maybe in the, at the reception, if you'd like to know more, you can speak to her. Uh, the, next internship, the next internship partner we've got is the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, the ECCHR, based in Berlin, in Germany. Um, it was founded by Wolfgang Kalek. I don't know if any of you came for the book launch, uh, but the Bonavera Institute hosted a book launch um, of his book titled Law vs. Power. It's quite an interesting account of transnational strategic litigation and the various considerations that went into it. Um, and as his book suggests, the organization also deals with transnational human rights claims. Um, he's also otherwise known as Edward Snowden's lawyer, so that's the kind of ethic with which the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights operates. Um, what you would do is you'd work on individual cases as well as broader program areas, and uh, you'd be involved in strategic legal interventions. So if you're interested in strategic litigation, and this is the organization to apply to. Uh, this is also for 10 weeks, like the previous internship, and the funding is £3,400. So that should also cover visa costs, etc. And then we've got Justice in London. Um, so justice, as its name suggests, deals with access to justice, the various justice systems, um, and human rights law. Uh, there are various reports that you can be involved in commenting on draft legislation, policies, law reform, working to submit comments to parliamentarians, etc. Uh, this internship is for eight weeks, and you will be funded up to £3,400. So the next internship that uh, we offer is one that is quite different from the others because it is a, a judicial clerkship. Um, and this one is based in Windhoek in Namibia uh, at the Supreme Court of Namibia. What foreign law clerks do, and I will speak more about my experience in South Africa, but this is based in Namibia. Um, what law clerks do is they work very closely with individual judges at the Supreme Court. Uh, and it's quite a different experience from working with the litigator because you get to see the legal system from the other side and from the decision-making side, um, where you prepare memoranda, do research for your various judges that you're working with, um, you attend hearings, you comment on hearings, engage in close discussions with various judges, are very close to how cases are decided, etc. Um, most recently, I mean, so there was an appeal against the electronic voting machines case. Um, I don't know if you're following on the Human Rights Hub blog, but uh, one of... Uh, 
one of our friends who's just submitted a defa uh, is involved in this appeal and his name is Njodi. I don't know if any of you know him, but uh, he will probably be back in Oxford. So if anyone has any questions about the Namibian Supreme Court, you can direct them at me. I'm happy to forward them on uh, to someone who's been there uh, before. But yeah, you might be lucky enough to be there for the appeal of the EVM case. Oh, sorry, the duration is six months and the funding is about 4,200 pounds. Uh, we then have the public law project, which is based in London again. And um, if you're keen to do research, casework, and litigation, all in the same organization, um, particularly legal aid-related work or benefits-related litigation, then the public law project is a space where you can consider applying. Um, of course, there will be Brexit-related work, as most London-based organizations will be doing. Uh, the duration of this internship is eight weeks, and the funding is 3,400 at max. We've then got redress, which deals specifically with justice for torture survivors um, and transnational litigation in relation to torture, um, particularly international human rights law work on the prohibition of torture and inhumane or degrading treatment. So um, you probably work on cases, a lot of advocacy and communications work, uh, maybe some drafting for petitions, etc. The duration of this internship is eight weeks and the funding is about the same, 3,400. And then we've got Reprieve, um, which is also based in London. Um, some of you may have attended uh, the event that we held last term, uh, where the, found, the head of Reprieve right now, Maya Foa, spoke about uh, her work using um, creative uh, ways of targeting countries that have not yet abolished the death penalty. Um, for example, targeting lethal injections, pharmaceuticals that manufacture lethal injections, and the purchasers of lethal injections. Uh, in a way in which uh, the protection of the most vulnerable people can be secured. So um, at Reprieve, you'll join a team of not just lawyers, but also investigators and campaigners to ensure that governments are held to account, uh, particularly on the death penalty. So the duration is for eight weeks and funding is about 3,400 maximum. Oh, some of our fellows here will speak about uh, their experience at Reprieve, so you can hear more about that and ask any questions that you may have. Uh, we've also got an Oxford-based option, um, which is um, an Oxford-based legal aid firm uh, that's dedicated specifically to the community in which we live, uh, which would be a great way for you to contribute to the community outside of simply university activities. Um, th this is a legal aid clinic uh, at Huntercombe, and there are two positions that are available. Catherine here will talk to us a little bit more about her experience about uh, at Turpin and Miller. So you can ask the questions that you have on that. Um, the duration for that is 10 weeks, uh, which is split up into two to three days per week or 20 hours, depending on your availability and requirement. And the funding is £1,850 to enable you to live and work. Um, and then we've got an, uh, something that's broader than an internship partner. So it's a fellowship that it's a Samuel Paisa Traveling Fellowship, uh, which allows you to bring uh, to the interview an internship that you would like to apply to um, and uh, provide a detailed uh, breakdown of costs, etc., and motivate for that particular fellowship um, in relation to uh, how that relates to your academic work as well as human rights work in a developing country. Uh, so, for example, uh, former fellows have worked at the International Center for Transitional Justice, Women's Link Worldwide Colombia, which is an NGO. And, for example, I've worked at the South African Constitutional Court as a former law clerk, as a foreign law clerk at the time. I'll talk more about that uh, just now. But the funding for that is £4,000 at max. And there's an eligibility requirement for this, uh, which I'll come to just now. We also have our OPPP, intern we collaborate with OPPP to have an internship scheme as well, and Gayatri will talk more about it. This is just an overview um, so that we don't forget the two uh, programs that they offer, Project 39A, and there are two general applications, but Gayatri will tell us more about that. So when I mention eligibility, um, if you are studying law in any capacity, um, whether you're in the final year of your BA program, um, or if you are currently pursuing a research degree or a taught graduate course at the law faculty, or if you have previously pursued law and you have a previous law degree, then you are eligible for some of these programs at the very least. Um, there are certain uh, eligibility criteria that are really important. For example, 
with the Samuel Paisa Fellowship, you're not permitted, you're not eligible if you are not currently pursuing a graduate law degree. Um, and with the OPBP fellowships as well, you're not eligible if you're an undergraduate student in law. Um, but yeah, so these are the, so don't worry, all of this is available on the website and it's very clear. If you have any questions, you can always direct them at Christos or at me. I'm happy to answer. Um, yeah, and in terms of the application process, the deadline is Friday, 21st of February um, at 12 noon. You can email your application in. Um, we need the following things. That is, first, a completed application form. We need your CV, letters of reference to, um, scan copies of your official transcripts, and a letter explaining exactly why you want to do this and what your past experience or interest is in public interest work. Um, we then shortlist for an interview, which is on the 27th of February, but that's, of course, to be confirmed. If if you have any more questions, we can deal with them in the Q&A, and um, alternatively, you can check on the website, because it's really easy to access all of these details on the Bonavero website. If you just go to um, the link that's mentioned on um, the slide, that's um, the Bonavero page on the law faculty website, just underneath it says, call for application, student fellowships, click on that, and you're set. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to Christos now to talk to us about the former fellows. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to hand over to Gayatri, apologies, to talk about OPVP. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really sorry that this might be seeming like an overload of information, but um, I want to first take this opportunity to welcome all of you here on behalf of the Oxford Pro Bono Publico as well. Uh, it's really exciting to see that so many of you are keen on pursuing internships related to human rights and international law here. And it's, it's really exciting for all of us as people who have done similar internships in the past. Um, now, some of you may have heard about Oxford Pro Bono Publico because we are the ones who bombard you with emails asking if you would like to volunteer on all our research projects on trade union rights and judicial independence and basically a bunch of public interest law issues. Um, and in case you haven't heard of us before, well, now you know what we do. We are basically a group of postgraduate students who partner with NGOs, lawyers, and even UN special rapporteurs at times, to produce research on various issues of public interest law, broadly defined. So although a, a, a large majority of our projects are concerned with human rights law as well as international law. Um, apart from this research agenda that I have introduced to you, we also have an internships agenda, and that's what I would like to talk to you about today. Um, and ever since we were set up, in 2010, um, we have been supporting the puzzling postgraduate community here in Oxford to take up internships at various public interest organizations. And we basically provide them financial assistance in order to ensure that they're able to do so. And um, yeah, this is just to give you a taste of what we have been able to achieve in the past. We've been able to provide more than 15,000 pounds in grants since our inception. We've provided 25 internships and across 10 different countries and at quite interesting internship partners like Human Rights Watch, International Labor Organization, the Legal Resources Center and Women's Legal Center in South Africa. Really, really exciting places to work at. And this year we will be offering internships primarily at Project 39A in India. And we also have two general calls for applications where you can pursue an internship wherever you want to, whatever organization you want to work at, and we will provide you the funding for you to do so. Um, so just so I'm able to quickly tell you about uh, Project 39A, it is based in New Delhi in India. And in case you're pursuing the comparative human rights elective on the BCL, you must have already heard about this organization. But just in case you are not pursuing that course, um, the Project 39A, they basically carried out um, research of monumental significance on how the death penalty is awarded in India. And 
but more broadly, they, they gleaned a lot of empirical data on execution rates in India, the socioeconomic um, profiles of the convicts, etc. And now they're also expanding into other areas of criminal justice reforms, such as um, torture that is used against the convicts and the mental health of people in prisons, torture, uh, sorry, DNA forensics and the likes. So yeah, um, you will be expected to intern there at least for a duration of four weeks if you choose to take up this internship and you will be provided financial assistance to the extent of 2,000 pounds. Um, and Rishika here will be able to give you more details on the kind of work that they offer, her experience there, and also if you have any concerns about living in Delhi, she will be able to address all of that. Um, but in case you are someone who has already secured an internship in any area of public interest law, human rights law, international law, and are just looking for funding, we've got you covered. So we're looking to support at least two students um, with a stipend of 1,500 pounds each. So this is your chance to explore an organization that whose work you love, especially if you haven't already heard the name of this organization mentioned by Sanya in her long list. Um, yeah, in the past, we have been able to offer internships at the International Labour Organization in various other UN offices, as well as in South Africa through these general calls. So yeah. The only catch, as Sanya has mentioned, for applying for OPBP funds is that you need to be a postgraduate student. We are exclusively catering for postgraduate students as of now. Um, yeah, so that's about it. The rest of the application process is the same as the one for the Bonavero Student Fellowships, and you will find all information that you need about uh, the OPBP internship scheme as well under the Bonavero portal. So yeah, if you do have any questions, please do direct them to Rishika. She'll be able to address you on both the general call for applications as well as Project 39A. And if you have any other logistical questions, you can come to me. Thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone, from my side as well. Uh, my name is Christos Kipreos. I'm the programs manager here at the Institute. Thank you for coming. Today, we are very glad to have uh, seven uh, past fellows with us to share their experiences. And without further ado, let's move to the speakers. We'll start with Ayman Nati that has interned in the past uh, in justice and in reprieve. Please, Ayman. Uh, hello. Um, and. Uh, Welcome. I'd like to uh, echo Gaitari's welcome uh, to the Bonavera Institute. Uh, it's a good thing you're all here. Uh, my name is Eamon Atti. Uh, I did the BCL last year, and I'm currently a judicial assistant at uh, the Court of Appeal. Uh, last year for the Summer Fellowship, I uh, interned at Justice. Um, I also happened to intern at Reprieve as well, so if any of you I want to speak about preferences. I can offer a perspective on both. Um, I'm a bit of a slow speaker, so I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to be as quick as possible. Uh, I'm going to structure my talk uh, in three parts. Um, uh, number one, what is justice and what do they do? Uh, number two, what did I do at justice? And number three, what can you gain uh, from doing a fellowship at justice? And uh, in regards to uh, number one, uh, uh, justice is an all-party uh, reform and human rights organisation that looks to uh, strengthen the justice system in the UK. And uh, they do this mainly in three ways. Uh, the first way I'd say is probably the most important way is by working parties. And what justice does is they group together uh, a bunch of um, academics, uh, barristers, solicitors, um, activists, and judges even, uh, who are experts in a certain field. And they will explore an issue that's in need of reform, uh, conduct evidence gathering sessions, and come together for meetings, and by the end of it, produce a report. 
and uh, s some of the reports in the past have included recommendations like setting up the CPS itself or um, the Criminal Cases uh, Review Commission uh, and other things. Uh, just to give you a, a bit of a flavour, some of the um, current working parties are um, the racial disparity in youth justice, solving housing disputes, and some of their previous ones have included things like judicial diversity. Um, the second way uh, that justice uh, seeks to influence change is through consultation responses and briefings. Uh, so consultation responses will uh, provide commentary on draft legislation. I'll speak to you more about that and why I did. And uh, briefings and provide information, uh, nonpartisan information to officials and politicians um, to highlight um, significant implications uh, of poly, poli, uh, policy initiatives in the justice system. And uh, the third way, uh, which is very exciting for anyone who wants some hands-on practical experience in the law is through third-party interventions. And some of the previous cases that justice has intervened in include uh, the case of Belharge and Jack Straw. Uh, so on the second part of my uh, uh, discussion, please do tell me if I'm taking too long, um, is uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to work on all three uh, limbs of, of justice, so to speak. Uh, on working parties, I got to work on uh, uh, When Things Go Wrong, which is um, a project that's looking to reform the law surrounding public law, uh, public inquiries and inquests. So I was lucky enough to look at things like um, Grenfell, which is very topical, and uh, Hillsborough and other inquiries. Uh, number two, consultation responses. Um, I got to work on uh, responding to things like uh, knife crime prevention orders, armed forces immunity, and the CTRC. Uh, third party interventions. I was also lucky enough to work on the case of the century, uh, Miller number two, the prorogation case. Um, I did some uh, uh, comparative research for a possible intervention there. And uh, in regards to just also, um, it's worth saying, uh, speaking about the atmosphere at Justice, um, it really struck me how uh, friendly and family orientated the organ organization was. Um, there's a lot of uh, banter in the office, there's a lot of topical political discussions, and um, the director of Justice also happens to be a qualified yoga instructor. Um, so there is uh, weekly yoga sessions, if, uh, if, if that's uh, a strong incentive. Uh, it was for me. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, what can justice uh, offer you? Um, I think in terms of practical skills, I definitely honed my research, uh, drafting, and analytical skills. Uh, I gained uh, a knowledge of law reform uh, in the UK. I think that's really useful, career-wise, but also in general, if you, as any uh, legal professional, um, there's a lot of career investment from the staff. Um, uh, the lawyers kind of um, really happy to help in my applications, look over them, give me mock interviews and other things. And um, for anyone pursuing a career at the bar like myself, I think justice is a great uh, uh, fellowship uh, to be at. Um, I've been asked about justice um, in almost all my interviews I've done. Uh, so far, and in working parties, you're often working with barristers, so you can reference that in your applications, and obviously third-party interventions is great as well. Um, but yeah, that's... Uh, so if you're passionate about justice, then justice is the fellowship for you. Um. Thank you, Ayman. Very nice uh, cutscene line at the end. Uh, we'll now move to Catherine Kailin, that has interned with Turpin and Miller in the past. Please, Catherine. Um, hi, I'm, sorry, can anyone hear me? Maybe, okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Kalin. Um, I'm currently a DPhil student at the law faculty. Um, I previously completed my MPhil in criminology here at Oxford. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the Turpin and Miller fellowship placement through Bonavero last summer and fall. So I was based here in Oxford, was up in, at Turpin Miller two days a week. 
um, and was able to pursue the fellowship while also continuing my doctoral work. Um, and I'm happy to speak to that at any point. I think um, the flexibility component of the Turpin and Miller Fellowship is um, really exceptional. Um, in terms of the work itself, um, the <clears throat> Fellowship is part and parcel with a legal aid clinic up at Huntercombe. Um, Huntercombe is a foreign national men's prison. It's about 30 minutes outside of Oxford. Turpin and Miller itself is up the Cali Road. It's a 10 minute bike from the city center. Um, and the law firm focuses on um, immigration cases. Um, and while at the prison, you are looking at immigration matters. So you, it's a bi-weekly or fortnightly legal aid clinic or surgery. Um, incarcerated individuals come in, um, meet with people on the faculty, excuse me, um, on staff at Turpin and Miller or the fellows, um, and to discuss not the criminal matters of their cases, but rather their implications for their immigration status. Um, so working, doing quite a bit in terms of deportation, asylum claims, um, and in, while in the office, as opposed to while up at Hunter Combe, um, it's the nuts and bolts of casework. Um, so everything from chasing dental records to calling grandmothers of clients to ask for scans of documents to country research uh, to actually getting to go into London um, to meet with the barristers who will actually be representing the clients um, and helping in kind of an all hands on deck kind of matter. Um, so I guess if I were to try and, and sell this internship or, or fellowship placement in three points, um, the first would be it is act, I found it incredibly rewarding um, to feel like I was part of the Oxford but non-university affiliated community that's here um, and feel like I was giving back in some tangible way. The second would be the flexibility component, again, being able to pursue tangible work a lot while also maintaining one's independent research. Um, and the third would, would be getting to work with Tom Giles. He's the head of Turvin Miller. Um, he is a rocket. Um, he knows everything and anything there is to know about this type of work. And it was a privilege to get to work alongside him. Thank you, Catherine. And now we'll move to Rahul, who another past fellow uh, at Reprieve. Please, Rahul. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much uh, Kate, Christos and everyone else for having me here. Um, it is an honor and I remember participating as a student last year and how informative and useful the event was for me and my hope is that it will similarly, uh, it will be the same for you this year. So um, as Christos mentioned, I did a summer fellowship at Reprieve last summer uh, in August and September in their London office. <laughs> Uh, Sanya has already gone over the kind of work that Reprieve does, so I won't rehash that, uh, but only talk about my own experience. And so, so I did a six-week summer fellowship at Reprieve, and uh, they have a number of uh, number of. So fundamentally, they work on a set of human rights issues that span everything from pushing back against the use of the death penalty to countering the use of lethal force as an instrument of state policy. And, and the team that I worked in um, was involved in the latter, i.e. in trying to make sure that in counter-terror operations or in, 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 in remote warfare context, how human rights law can be upheld. And, and my supervisor was, uh, you know, this, this wonderful lady named Jennifer Gibson, who heads the, that team at Reprieve. So I thought it might be useful for me uh, to give you a few examples of the kind of work I did. Now, of course, I do need to preserve their confidentiality, so I can't go into too much detail. But maybe at a high level of generality, I can give a couple of examples of the kind of things I worked on to give you some flavor. Um, so one project that I worked on involved uh, the export of drone uh, parts from one country to another to be able to establish sort of the complicity of the country, the exporting country, in order to hold them liable for the ultimate uses to which those drone parts were put. <laughs> Uh, and, and that sort of involved looking at a lot of government data and and like news reports and other things that would show what sort of exports took place. 
uh, and this was in light. So some of you might be aware there was a judgment by a German appeals court last year, which said that Germany was liable because of it, the use of its airbase. Uh, for conducting drone operations. So they were trying to do something similar as regards the export of drone parts to establish complicity. Uh, the second was as regards an impending drone strike in a country that we sought to uh, prevent because a lot of, so one of the core insights that has flowed from the work that Reprieve has done thus far has been to showcase how drone technology is sort of based on imperfect intelligence and results in civilians being targeted um, unduly and therefore they, they try to prevent its use uh, until such time as it becomes more accurate. So they, they, we, we had information about an impending drone strike in a country and, and therefore my work involved looking at potential legal avenues to prevent that strike from taking place. So this included things like looking at judgments under international humanitarian law that say that you cannot use lethal force when the civilian casualties um, to which which might take place from that strike are high when there's a high likelihood of that happening. Third example might be uh, the work that I did. So, so another project was on trying to find out the legal architecture that governs um, military personnel from country A working for the military of country B, so being deployed in a foreign military and how country A may be complicit in the work that the military personnel do in that other military. Uh, I also did some amount of work for the, uh, the, the their SLIP program, which is the Stop Lethal Injections program. And uh, sort of Sanya adverted to Maya Fowa's visit um, uh, to the Bonavero Institute last term, who heads that team and and this kind of involved. So, so one of the interesting sort of insights that flowed from that experience was how Reprieve works on trying to find solutions to human rights problems that are not couched in human rights terms. So for instance, um, one of the things they do in, as part of the, the SLIP program is to try and convince pharmaceuticals to stop using, to, to stop allowing their, their injections to be used for administering the death penalty. And this they do not go do by going to them and saying, look how immoral the death penalty is, or trying to find out if the pharmaceutical, and all of this is up in, out in the public domain, so I'm not coughing up like secrets. So they, they, they try to, uh, make sure that you know these these pharmaceuticals are so it, it's not couched in moral or human rights terms but entirely in business oriented terms so for example saying things like look at the reputational damage that would be caused to you if it were to be found out that the work that you do results in the death penalty being administered and therefore this to me was one of the unique insights that I acquired uh, and then one of the things that the, the fellowship did provide me was, and my supervisor put it this way, exposure to the diverse kinds of things that Reprieve did, even if I myself wasn't involved in everything that they did, I was at least able to understand all of it at some level, uh, in some depth. And then I just thought, uh, you know, briefly, do I have... One or two minutes left, or am I running? Uh, half a minute, most. Half a minute. Okay. So, um, hmm. uh, I guess, uh, so the one point that I will make, and this may not necessarily be relevant to you if you do not identify as having a disability, was the extensive support that I got from the Bonavero in terms of additional funding that made it possible for me um, to obtain the support that I needed, such as accommodation, etc. I also did face a few teething issues and, and like when, when, when I came back to the Bonavero, we did a review process to take those into account. So if, if you do identify as having a disability or if that's something that does concern you about these fellowships, do feel free to reach out to me and we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And therefore, just to conclude, I'll say the one kind of takeaway for me was the gradual, methodical, measured way in which Reprieve tries to solve these problems, which may come across to you at first blush as being a depressing state of affairs. You know, countries who are supposed to be standard bearers in protecting human rights, uh, failing to do so. And therefore, that for me was like a key learning from the experience. I apologize for 
taking more time than I was supposed to. But I hope this was useful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. And now yet another a former intern at um, Reprieve. Uh, we have Risika Sankal with us, uh, but she, she will mostly speak for her experience in the Institute of Socioeconomic Rights in South Africa, and also present on the OPBB placement uh, for Project 39A in India. Thank you. Hi. I think Rahul has very eloquently described working at Reprieve. And if you have additional questions, please free, feel free to ask me. But otherwise, I will concentrate on talking about my experience in South Africa as well as Project 39A, uh, as pointed out. So I use the OPPP general fund to go to South Africa to pursue an internship in an area of law that I am interested in. So currently my DPhil project is on the right to housing and I look at South Africa as one jurisdiction. And I use the general fund to design an internship that is that works best for me, that I can pursue my DPhil research through by working at an organization that does cutting edge housing rights work in South Africa. So I went to the Socioeconomic Rights Institute in South Africa and I was very excited because almost all the cases that I read in the at the constitutional court level in South Africa have been pursued through the Socioeconomic Rights Institute. So things that I was just reading about sitting here in Oxford, I finally got to meet the people propelling those cases and uh, to talk to them about the strategies that they used to share with them my ideas on what they should or shouldn't have done. And as a legal nerd or a human rights nerd, I had a lot of fun doing all of that. I also got to meet many people who lent their names to the cases or the activists actually sitting on the ground and fighting for their own rights and that itself was also a very interesting experience for me. So I gained a lot in terms of my own personal DPhil research or my own human rights era interests. But the third thing that I learned was what it means to be doing human rights work in another jurisdiction. So I am from India and I have been living in the UK for a while now. But I have never been, I had never been to South Africa before and doing the OPPP internship or through OPPP getting the funds to do an internship at in South Africa gave me the experience of working on the ground in another jurisdiction. And of course, the challenges that different jurisdictions face can be similar yet overlapping. And to see how different organizations deal with actual everyday child human rights challenges on the ground is very interesting. And I will carry that experience with me wherever I go next. Uh, I don't intend to work in South Africa, but that experience will stay with me and I've learned a lot through it. Now, based on that, I think why you must, why you should consider doing an internship in India could be for similar reasons. So it could be that you're interested in criminal justice issues or the death penalty more specifically. And that might be an interesting way for you to approach India and to approach Project 39A as a as an internship that you might want to do because you'd get to see how death penalty work is done in a jurisdiction that may not be your own or where you have no other experience of. And even if you want to work at a regional human rights uh, organization or eventually work at the international human rights law sphere, it would be interesting to have different domestic jurisdiction experiences and to carry that with you in your future career. So that might be one way of approaching a Project 39A internship. And the other way to do to is just to see what different jurisdictions do to see the sort of challenges that people actually face doing human rights law work. And Project 39A does the most cutting edge uh, work on the death penalty in India at the moment. So every big death penalty case that has happened in the past few years, Project 39A has been involved in. And the most recent, I don't know if you would have heard of it, because, but even The Guardian is reporting and Al Jazeera is reporting and the BBC is reporting is, uh, a case to do with a violent rape and murder that took place in 2012. And the four convicts who were convicted of that offense are currently face facing execution so the, uh, the trial court had set a date for their execution and currently their lawyers are fighting that execution so there's a stay currently on board but it's 
ongoing every day either the state goes to court or the prisoners uh, lawyers go to court trying to fight off this execution so any cut any work that's being done on the death penalty in india today is being done through project 39a so it would be a very interesting and enriching experience and if you have any other questions about working in delhi living in delhi or any concerns feel free to ask me during the question and answer session but otherwise there are people who go and work in project 39a from abroad so they have regular fellows from melbourne law school in australia and they're able to find safe accommodation and a safe mode of transport to get to work and if you have any other concerns feel free to ask thank you risika and now we move to emily emily mcdonnell uh, who last year uh, last summer worked in jerusalem at the department of legal affairs of the united nations uh, relief and works agency for palestine refugees in the near east as a samuel pizer fellow uh, she has also given a very interesting and nice interview uh, about the, her experience, uh, who we posted today uh, in our uh, tweets and Facebook page. So uh, I encourage you to listen to it as well. But now we have her live here with us. Please, Emily. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, so as was said, I was the Samuel Pizar Travelling Fellow and I spent three months working um, with the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the legal HQ, which is in East Jerusalem. So it's in occupied Palestinian territory um, and I was with the legal team and so our area of operations covered the West Bank, Gaza, Syria, Lebanon and Jordan. Um, so essentially, I'll start with, I guess, where it all began and why I wanted to intern there. Um, so my supervisors had mentioned to me that it was a very intensive internship. Um, I do refugee law, that's my area of focus, and that's what I do my DFL in law in. However, I hadn't really looked at the issue of Palestinian refugees, so it was an area that I really wanted to explore. And I also wanted to take a break halfway through my DFIL to go and do some practical work and actually just have a, a break from working on the DFIL. Um, so I applied for the, obviously, the Samuel Pizar Fellowship with the, the internship already secure. So I'd applied for it, I had been interviewed, and then when I came to apply, I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do, but I really needed funding to support being able to go. Um, in terms of going to going into the internship, um, it was it was an extremely intensive internship. So, the legal HQ at the moment, and it kind of always is, is quite understaffed. And so, I, I wouldn't classify my work there as an intern. I was working as a legal officer, um, doing lots and lots of tasks, um, and it was a very full on full time work for three months. Um, but it was extremely valuable. So, I was in the international law team. So I did, basically my tasks can be classified as casework and then um, general research and working on policy documents and other legal documents. So some of the casework that I did was working with Palestinian refugees who had fled the region to Europe and then we were working with the asylum authorities in Europe to see whether they fall under our mandate or the UNHCR mandate. So there's some very complex legal questions about whether they should be granted refugee status in Europe or whether they should be sent back potentially to one of our areas of operation. When I was there, the organisation was going through um, some difficulties. It's the biggest um, UN organisation, has 30,000 staff. Um, and so I was often trying to deal with the, the intersection between policy and also law. Um, so one of the things I had to do was go through to make sure that any legal document or human rights document we released was um, had been checked for political sensitivities. Uh -huh. So for example, we wouldn't want in a document a reference to a one or a two state solution. And I would help um, some, the, basically the heads of the organisation with PowerPoints to donors um, in the lead up to the renewal of UNRWA's mandate, how we're addressing these attacks on our organisation by the US, by Israel, and also um, incursions on our actual premises in East Jerusalem. I don't know how much time I've got, so I'll try and keep the rest of it brief. Um, the, I, 
as I said, my default in law is on refugee law. Um, and so I look at freedom of movement. So it was really beneficial for me to see how this issue played out in the Palestinian context. And that was really, really valuable because it's given a very holistic understanding to me for my DPhil project and also this issue more broadly. And also I got to apply what I'd learnt in my undergrad, my masters, and also my DPhil to a practical legal experience. It solidified for me the fact that I don't want an academic career, um, even though I'm, I, 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 knew, I knew it already, but it, it helped confirm it, that I really want to be within an international organisation, whether or not it will be the UN, I'm not sure. Um, and I will say, just going on to the challenges, um, <coughs> it's, I was working in the Middle East, so as a woman it was quite difficult. Um, I lived in occupied Palestinian territory, sorry, I worked in occupied Palestinian territory, but I lived in Israel. Um, so there's things to consider as a woman when you go there. So if anyone's thinking of working in the Middle East, I'd be happy to talk about it. The visa process was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> and if anyone does want to talk about that, sorry, I feel like I'm losing my voice, but um, Israel is very strict on people coming in to do work with Palestinians. So that's a process that you need to really think through. And when you arrive, when you exit, you're going to be interrogated by <laughs> the Israelis about what you're doing. So it is something to think about. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. Thanks a lot. And now we move to Ashley Barnes, um, who is a former intern at Redress. The floor is yours, Ashley. Thanks, Christos. I also feel like I'm losing my voice. Redress is a quite a small organisation, an international human rights law NGO in London. And they have, as Sanya said, a lot of strategic litigation in international fora for torture victims. They're also doing a lot of work on universal jurisdiction. But in addition to their litigation work, they have a very strong um, advocacy arm, which is more about policy, lobbying governments, making submissions uh, in different uh, forums and commissions. And <coughs> from their many decades of experience, they have a really strong network with um, many other NGOs that they're working with uh, and various governments and heads of state. So it was a really interesting organisation to step into um, and particularly the size, I think, as a very small organisation of less than 10 people in the London office and then another office in the Netherlands. Um, it meant that you were instantly part of the team and in my view I don't think Redress could operate without interns and that's something that they acknowledge. Um, so you definitely feel like you're both gaining um, practical legal experience but also making a valuable contribution which was part of what I was looking for when I took on this opportunity. Uh, it also meant there were many other interns at the, working at the same time as you. So there was two um, Bonavero fellows that went to redress. Um, and I just mentioned that to highlight that we actually had very different experiences. Um, we both just finished the BCL, but we were looking for slightly different things. And I had previously worked as a lawyer um, before studying, whereas Sneha hadn't. And the reason that I'm raising this also is to say that Charlie, who heads redress or is one of the um, senior legal advisors at Redress in London, really um, listened to us and heard us and created an experience for each of us that was diverse and reflected what we were after. So for me, that meant working on one project for the duration of my internship. I wanted to really take something on and master it and um, that resulted in a report on transitional justice in Sudan. So it was incredibly topical and worthwhile and exciting to work on and to work on that with um, African partner organisations such as the Centre for African Peace and Justice um, and to kind of just carry that on as one project throughout my time there was um, what I wanted. Um, but other interns in the office were doing much more um, litigation work, so a lot more piecemeal, fast-paced kind of tasks related <coughs> to witness prep and other submissions. So um, I think whatever organisation you end up with, there is scope um, to tailor your experience. And my advice is to kind of think clearly about you want what you want from it and um, raise those uh, uh, 
concerns and goals because um, it's both about what you're um, contributing and what you're learning. Um, and then the other key takeaway for me was just the kind of day-to-day -day lived reality of what it's like to work in quite a small NGO and some of the challenges associated with that, um, some of the non-glamorous parts of it, um, the way that kind of bustling with energy and ideas from my BCL <coughs> year, you kind of brought back down to earth and realised the limitations, both financial and practical, um, that practitioners face. And I think that my internship really showed me that bridge between scholarship and practitioner that Kate referred to right at the beginning. Um, and uh, it was genuinely uh, the case sometimes that the BCL or other master students um, were making contributing ideas from the scholarship that practitioners hadn't um, weren't up to date with um, and then vice versa that um, practitioners could give this insight that um, no number of uh, legal articles and books could convey so that day-to-day -day reality then arms you as a fellow with uh, the insight um, that will help you either confirm your aspiration to work in that field and in those kinds of organisations or um, yeah, inform your future decisions. So I think that um, the experience can be really valuable for your career planning uh, as well as allowing you to do some really interesting work and make a valuable contribution. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, it's Sanya Samdani. Uh, she's going to speak with us about her uh, experience with the South African Constitutional Court uh, in the summer of 2018. You don't need further introductions, I think. Thanks, Christos. Um, yeah, I actually thought I'd start with um, generally what I my experience as a judicial clerk because this is equally relevant for the Namibian Supreme Court experience as well. Um, so much to the chagrin of legislators, political theorists, and Aradhya, who works on political parties, <laughs> courts have been the focus of legal theorists and legal scholarship for ages. I mean, we spend so much time with judgments, um, just reading through them as law students, as litigators, as researchers. So um, doing a judicial clerkship is really interesting because you get to actually see what goes into a judgment. So you get to look at the process behind the judgment. And that's something that you don't really think of. You just think of the judgment as the text or as a document, but there are a whole lot of things that go into it. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting to see what it's like uh, behind the scenes in courts, because the judgment is what carries with it that normative force. Um, it was also great for me to feel useful. Uh, two years into my DPhil, I was feeling a little frustrated uh, that my work and my research wasn't being applied to anything. Um, and the DPhil, as I was reminded, is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, but it was helpful for me to apply myself to um, research on discrete legal issues in court because uh, I would see memos that I wrote to my judge or other memorial, I mean, memorandums that were, memoranda that were written um, actually being used in um, reworking a judgment, for example. Uh, you also find out that what goes into a judgment is not just uh, the research, etc. It's also a lot of formatting, a lot of liaising with people, um, just a lot of actual nuts and bolts work um, that's very important in producing a polished judgment. You also see what it's like in terms of the case flow and case management of the superior courts uh, in perhaps what is one of the most unequal countries in the world, in South Africa. So you sort of get a sense of the number of applications, the new applications that come in, uh, the number of cases that are dismissed um, summarily, the number of cases that judges write short judgments for, and the very small fraction of cases that judges decide to set down for a hearing. Um, so that's also quite interesting from the access justice perspective. Um, it's also good because, um, it's also different because you pay very different sorts of attention to hearings. Uh, usually you're sort of on one side or the other, but uh, when you're a clerk, you're kind of trying to evaluate these arguments against uh, one another. So that's quite interesting. It was also quite fun because, um, uh, so foreign law clerks and generally law clerks in the South African Constitutional Court are allowed to call cases. So just before, so it's it's sort of like, uh, I call the matter of, and so you, you get to stand in court and do that. So that was quite cool. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and in addition to that, you build a community of researchers and people who go on to do various things, uh, which were the Clark body that I worked with. Uh, it was quite fun because all of, most of them were nerds, um, just like me. So um, uh, about six months later, um, I, uh, along with a few of my other Clark friends, former Clark friends, applied for a conference that reviewed decisions of the Constitutional Court in the previous quarter when I was there. And I wrote for that um, conference and so did my friends and it was really great because uh, we were able to look at the judgment quite differently from other people. And it was quite a nice community that was built as well. So the placement is for six months. Um, and uh, there are very few courts in the world that allow foreign, uh, foreigners to clerk at the court. So the South African and Namibian Supreme, the South African Constitutional Court and the Namibian Supreme Court are two uh, of a few. Uh, in terms of living and working in Johannesburg, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I had never lived in Johannesburg before. Um, and everything worked out pretty smoothly. Uh, of course, as Emily suggested with the visa applications, this is also a different kind of nightmare. But again, I'm happy to talk through the various reports and things you need to get in order to be in, let into the country. Um, in terms of the application process for the foreign law clerkship, it's relatively simple. You need to submit a writing sample and you get an interview with a judge who's interested in you. Um, and then you get to see whether you're a good fit for that judge. Um, otherwise, another judge may pick you up, depending on your, the strength of your application, etc. cetera. Um, and in terms of the Samuel Paisa application process, you have to make sure that the work that you're going to do, so I applied to this, uh, well, I applied to the Samuel Paisa Traveling Fellowship to fund this particular clerkship. So if that's what you're keen to do, uh, so this is not for the Namibian Supreme Court. The Namibian Supreme Court is not under the Samuel Paisa. So if you are an undergraduate student who's finishing this year or who would like to be at the Namibian Supreme Court, you can do this without worrying about the Samuel Paisa a graduate student bar. Uh, in any event, I applied to the Samuel Paisa, and I, uh, my DFL, um, uh, my DFL is divided into two parts, and one part has case studies, of which South Africa is one. So, being and ensconcing myself in, um, in the general judicial system of South Africa was really helpful in terms of knowing the law, sort of like what Rishika said, in terms of understanding how the law is applied, etc. Um, it was, it's also helpful for someone who's interested in global south collaboration. So if you're interested in like a non-Eurocentric view of what courts look like, this is probably, these two programs are good programs to apply to. Uh, yeah, and finally, it was interesting to see how a jurisdiction with enforceable socioeconomic rights functions generally. Um, yeah, and I think that it's a great model. But anyway, more about that later. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Sanya. Thank you, everybody, for this very um, useful insights that you shared with us today. And uh, now I'm opening the floor to your questions. Uh, please feel free to ask. And uh, it's a very rare opportunity to have um, uh, all these past fellows with us. And uh, please make use of it. Thank you. Please. Um, I think you should apply to the program that you want to apply to anyway, because um, given the fact that the Bonavero fellowships are tailored to the individual person who applies, it doesn't matter if you haven't had hands-on experience in the field. What matters is how you demonstrate your interest in public interest work generally. So if you really care about social justice and you've written this great essay about it, that's fine. You should apply. And also I should, I mean, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that women often self-select out of out of things and not applying because they don't feel qualified enough. Don't fall in that trap. Just apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we have not had that many applications from undergrads, but we have sent, I think, no different a proportion of undergrads who've applied. I mean, haven't looked back at the numbers, but um, we 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 have sent, I think, a similar proportion to graduates who've applied. Um, our partners are very open to undergrads. They do want people who are in the qualifying year, so as, you, as you're getting it, as you are in your third year. Um, I don't think there's any reason at all why you shouldn't apply. Um, and we would be, you know, it's, it's open to you. There's no sense that you'd be a second class applicant. Yeah. Uh, 
Please, other questions? Yes, okay. please. So I have a question that's just like quite a practical one. Oh, thank you. So I think we are supposed to give a breakdown of expenses in our application form. And one thing that like I've struggled with is knowing like, should I be trying to like, do you get what I mean? Like run the risk of underestimating and thus have an inflated amount. But would I be a more attractive candidate if I was a cheaper intern? Essentially is my question. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Basically, no. And I, what we will do with you when... That's a good question, and I'm glad you've asked it, because exactly the sort of thing people think, oh, I don't know how to ask that question. Um, what we do is we actually work quite closely with people once the, um, once the fellowships are awarded, because very often we actually have better knowledge than you have about what actually the costs are because of our previous experience. And I think many of the people here who've been, particularly when you're going to somewhere, somewhere outside of the UK... Um, have you know relatively little idea. So we'll work with you and, and look at that. And we're very committed to making sure that a reasonable estimate is um, is made. And generally, in terms of certainly the Bonavera fellowships, um, you know, as, as Rahul has indicated, we don't want to leave people in in difficulties. And we we've set the numbers thinking in the light of our experience that this is an appropriate amount. It's not going to you know cover you for eating out every night or, you know, going on a holiday along the way, but it should cover your, um, your needs. And the amount has, has been raised, has been increased uh, substantially, I think, this year, so. Yes, sorry, can I respond to that as, as well? Um, just on that, I mean, when I was calculating, uh, when I was doing my expenses, I was like really frugal and conservative with my estimates, and I kind of really regret it, I kind of regretted it. Um, after I was awarded it, and uh, the sum was a bit tight for me. So if I'd give kind of some advice, kind of really think, just include everything, you know, um, and then um, there's probably negotiation. Uh, but yeah, just, uh, you know, don't, don't be overly frugal. <laughs> Please, other questions? No one? Have you been interested in uh, one of these um, organizations? Maybe you can no, raise a question. Please, yes. For the, mot oh God. For the motivational answer, um, on the website itself, you can say that actually we can put multiple preferences. Mm -hmm. um, so what detail do you want to go into? Is it like kind of commercial applications where it's really, oh, I love this law firm. Um, why not? But really what we love or what we care about is the work, or it, you know, human rights in general and for example in between the London ones while they do do different work it will converge in some sense um, so I was just wondering you know what kind of thing response you want so I mean I think what we would like to know is why it is you want to do these fellowships and obviously if you are um, applying for different ones and you think there are different reasons as to why you've listed them then give us those reasons but if you think that all of these organizations that you've identified mm -hmm work in a particular area that is of interest to you, then you can deal with it. I mean, really what we're wanting to know is what your motivation is for wanting to do this, how you, you know, why, it, why it's of interest to you, what your kind of commitments are and where you see it fitting into your overall career plans. Yes, please. Uh, excuse me, Rahul wants to add something on, on the last question. Uh, so ju just to add to that, I guess for me, for so while, while, while you're right in saying that there is a high degree of crossover in the work that a number of organizations do, there are distinguishing factors as well. So for instance, for me, uh, last year, I remember there was a, pa a person on the panel who had done a Bonavera Fellowship at Reprieve. And therefore, the fact that I had been exposed to someone who had actually worked there uh, made all the difference for me, even if in sort of as a factual matter, much of what they do might be similar to what like a bunch of other organizations are doing as well. So there can be those distinguishing factors which you should keep in mind and also cite in your application if you can. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much. I had a question about the dates. Uh, so many internships are eight weeks, or you say negotiable. Um, do they also have a specific starting date and end date, or can it be whenever it fits us, especially August, for example? Yeah. So each of the partners have their own views as to dates. 
Um, generally, they're pretty flexible. We've selected the eight weeks so that it means that um, it can fit in the period before, between you know, finishing your studies, if you're going from either undergraduate to postgraduate or moving from, a, say, a BCL to a, an MPhil. So it's in, in, often they're done in that period between mid to late July and mid to late September. Um, but there is flexibility about it. So sometimes people would actually like to do it in October and November, depending on what their plans are for the following year. And there is flexibility. And there's generally some flexibility, too, about precisely the number of weeks you spend. But the idea was to actually have enough time in the organization for you to be able to settle down, adapt, and do something constructive and not just sort of be a little tourist in and out of the organization where you can't really make a contribution. So by and large, our partners have said they like people to come for eight weeks. Sometimes people go for six, um, and sometimes people have gone for a bit longer. But generally that's the thinking behind it and again once you are um a, you know granted one of the fellowships then the process of negotiating with the actual partner about the start date commences um, just one more thing so uh, if you are considering the judicial clerkships then of course it depends on the term dates of that particular court um so for me for example well with the constitutional court there are two intakes there's one in january and there's one in july so you can decide, depending on your circumstances and in conversation with the judge, uh, when you want to go. Yeah. And on the Namibian court, it sits three terms a year, and it's very important to actually be there during the terms. <coughs> so that also involves a little bit of looking at that particular clerkship. Other questions? Yes, please. Hi, um, I just had a question about the references. Do they have to be um, academic references or could they be from like an employer or a previous like internship? Not necessarily. I know one of the things that happens to people is quite often they don't know academics that well and they might, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be. If you are, if you're in the middle of a graduate research degree, it is a good idea to have a reference from your supervisor because it's quite important for those of us who are doing the selection to know that you've consulted with your supervisor over this and your supervisor's happy. So that's the one must get, in my view. Um, it, it is helpful for us to get a sense from, particularly from one of our colleagues in Oxford. So if you have got somebody in Oxford that you know well, it could be your, it could be your college um, uh, advisor rather than your faculty advisor. Um, but it's quite good because that also gives us somebody to talk to if we, you know, if we've got any queries or whatever, just somebody we know. Um, but beyond that, it's relatively, um, you know, it, 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 I wouldn't say that they all have to be academic um, um, referees. Um, I just have something to add. So if you are an undergrad and you've picked like human rights law as your option, for example, or if you've picked public international law but you're writing about human rights law, then you can also ask your tutor for a reference and that's also accepted. Um, so don't worry, if you want to ask a tutor, that's also fine. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have another question? No? Okay, then, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we'd like to particularly thank our speakers uh, for uh, joining us and uh, sharing with you uh, their experiences. And now we'll have a reception. Uh, it will take place in the lower atrium, uh, just uh, across the door here. And we'll be glad to discuss with you further uh, bilaterally uh, on your questions, on the requirements of the program, on the application process, and also if you would like to speak uh, with our speakers as well uh, about their experiences in private, please feel free. Thank you very much. <laughs>